It is uh, time for my usual disclaimers and introduction. Uh, for those of you who've joined us in one of these sessions before, my name is Heidi Seaton. I'm um, VP of Legal and Compliance here at Orange Tree. Um, and I um, am an attorney, but I'm not your attorney. I think it's important um, that we say that. Um, the things I'm talking about here today are really intended to be educational, not legal advice. Um, I do want you to consult your own um, legal um, and compliance resources uh, for any specific questions you have um, about content. Um, but we do uh, talk to a lot of employers um, in the background screening industry. We talk to, um, to our own um, clients. Uh, we talk to other CRAs. Um, and so we do want to share the benefit of what we're hearing about, what we're seeing, things we think employers should be at least thinking about. Um, so that gets us to our agenda slide. Um, commonly discussed topics in our sessions here, we're gonna talk about ban the box and what we're seeing um, around clean slate legislation. Uh, it's the time of year uh, for drug testing updates. We had a couple of um, states that had voter initiatives that passed and a few other updates as well. Um, we've got some I-9 form updates and reminders, just a few things uh, happening there related actually still to sort of carry over from COVID. Um, so we'll get you an update on that. Uh, we're gonna talk about privacy legislation. We don't talk about that every time, but we do have a few things going on uh, at the state level, uh, an update at some federal, uh, regarding some federal legislation, and then we're gonna just um, dip into uh, EU and US data transfer um, framework news. So that's um, something we don't talk about a lot here, but I think it's worth bringing out to this group. We also had uh, some regulatory activity from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, applicable to background screening uh, since the last time we talked. So we're gonna talk about the new human trafficking regulation, especially related to how you as an end users of consumer reports would be impacted by that. Uh, and then we do have a little update or reminder regarding uh, regulated employment verification for our federal motor carrier safety administrated regulated employers. So uh, that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I think we'll just go ahead and move right into our first topic, ban the box. So again, just um, a reminder, if you're, if you're new to the sessions or if it's been a little while, ban the box is the, the legislation and ordinance passing that we're seeing happening across the country. More and more, we're seeing it happening even, even at, city, at cities and counties. Um, and so we had a new one in Texas that passed. Um, so that was the, um, the uh, county, uh, Harris County in Texas, which is most of the city of Houston. So if you're wondering how that's applicable, um, it does apply only to public employers. So basically um, uh, county um, agencies or, or county um, appointees, not to elected officials. Uh, but it was passed with immediate effect. It says that public employers um, can inquire into criminal background of the candidate only after a conditional offer of employment. That's pretty common, um, what we're seeing in Ban the Box regulation, ordinance passing and, and legislation these days. Uh, they tend to try to push that question um, or that inquiry into a candidate's criminal history to the very latest or last step that they can, which really is um, after the conditional offer has been made and then it's usually a part of the background screening process. So um, further, uh, Harris County also prohibits blanket disqualification of applicants solely based on conviction and requires an individualized assessment. So that's another trend that we're seeing um, where with these ban with ban the box legislation, they all not only um, determine when the employer can take into consideration or ask questions about the consumer's criminal history, um, but they also then start to legislate or codify um, the EEOC guidance related to employers' consideration of criminal history information, which basically says that EEOC guidance, which is, I feel like it's about 10 years old by now, but that basically says, hey, employers, you can't have a, a blanket disqualification. You have to take into consideration things like, um, 
the green factors, the nature of the conviction, how long it's been since the conviction, other mitigating um, factors. So here we, again, just have an example of um, that county um, taking that and, and making it part of the ordinance. Again, uh, employers should be paying attention to uh, who these ordinances are applicable to, in this case, Harris County, uh, right now are only applicable to public employers. Um, so do this at the county level, probably mostly with um, appointees. Uh, they carved out elected officials um, for some reason. Um, also, so this is a bit of a trend in Texas. So just uh, know we also have, um, we, don't, we don't have a statewide um, ban the box legislation in Texas, but we are seeing um, counties take this up as well as cities. So Travis County um, has banned the box, applies to public employers. Um, Dallas County does as well, San Antonio does. Um, and then the cities of Austin and DeSoto um, also both have um, ordinances that apply both to public and private employers. So um, if you're in Texas, maybe start to be looking and thinking about if there's local ordinances that you need to be concerned about. Um, speaking of local ordinances, um, we did hear that the city of Atlanta in Georgia um, passed a ordinance that makes it discriminatory for employers um, to consider a candidate's criminal history. Um, so an outright um, attempt to um, to create a protected class of uh, people with criminal history um, could be a significant impact to our employer clients that are in Atlanta. Uh, there are exceptions. So there's an exception if a state or federal law bars employment of individuals with certain convictions or violations from being employed or if the employer's decision was based on how the criminal history relates to the physician's responsibilities in accordance with whether the applicant committed the offense, the nature and gravity of the offense, the time since the offense, and the nature of the job. Um, so again, um, codifying those the EEOC guidance about employers not having a blanket policy, not having an outright um, bar to employing individuals with criminal history, but instead um, doing an individualized assessment of how that job relates to that position. Um, so uh, that was also um, with immediate effect. So um, Atlanta employers um, not subject to an exception should probably be paying attention and potentially um, implementing uh, that assessment step if they're not already doing that. Moving from um, ban the box to clean slate legislation, they're very often go together. Um, so we have them grouped together in our presentation. Um, California, um, we saw passed a clean uh, slate uh, legislation here. Um, and so uh, just to give a little background, clean slate legislation, what does that mean? So most states have some mechanism for um, allowing records to be expunged or sealed through some petitioning process. Um, so this is, it's not new particularly, but what we're seeing is legislation that sort of automates um, that uh, petitioning process, process. So for instance, here in California, um, SB 731 um, allows that felony records are automatically sealed if they occurred before um, the 1st of January of 2005. And if the ind individual has completed all of their incarceration, probation, um, supervision, community supervision, whatever, whatever other uh, post-incarceration uh, requirements they had, parole perhaps. And then also if they're then not convicted of a new felony for four years. So um, it's time-based, right? So it's looking at how long has passed since the individual uh, was convicted, and then also um, have they been able to, um, have they also then not been convicted of a, of a new crime um, for four years uh, after that release or parole. Um, there is a July 1st, 2023 effective date, and it does, um, it, it is intended to 
to be an automatic automatic seal. So there's not a petition requirement here um, under this new legislation in California. It does have exceptions. So registered sex offenders, um, those underlying records uh, would not be automatically sealed. Um, and then it talks about individuals convicted of violent or serious felonies. So um, presumably the courts um, will determine uh, what that criteria is. Um, and it does carve out an exception for um, uh, employers that are uh, screening for teaching or in public education or are doing teacher credentialing. Uh, presumably they're accessing these court records directly from the state. So the state will um, have to have some way to um, seal or expunge some records for some, some cases and then not for others. Um, so more probably we'll hear more about this one, but may not, right? It could just be a case where criminal records that, um, you know, we might have found um, in the past will just simply uh, no longer be available when we do searches in California. We also had uh, big news at the federal level um, earlier I guess it was last month now, it is November, um, but uh, President Biden issued a, a proclamation granting a pardon for the offense of simple possession of marijuana. Um, I've got this slide in clean slate. Uh, it's also related to what we're seeing um, in drug testing law changes. So even though at the federal level, marijuana is still um, a controlled substance, um, we did see uh, this move towards pardoning uh, simple possession. Um, the, the order basically uh, asked the Attorney General to administer and effectuate uh, the issuance of certificates of pardon to eligible applicants charged or convicted of the offense of simple possession of marijuana in violation of the Controlled Substance Act, um, and then instructs the Attorney General to develop and announce an application. Um, procedure for certifications of pardon and to begin accepting those applications as soon as possible. Um, note uh, that it does not apply to any other uh, possession violations, so only uh, simple marijuana possessions. So, um, and then just note too, uh, this is only uh, under federal law, right? So if you are adjudicated or if you're in your candidates, um, have um, convictions under state law, this pardon does not apply. Um, the vast majority of simple possession um, cases are gonna be under state law, right? There's not that much, there's not that much felony prosecution of simple possession. Um, not saying there's none, but um, for the most part, um, those are happening at the state. Um, but big news, especially uh, considering that uh, marijuana is still illegal uh, under federal law. So um, watch for more on that. That was a um, an executive order. So um, we'll see if there's a legislation or follow-on legislation related to it. I sort of given um, the state of federal legislation right now, I, I'd be surprised if we see any more. So moving then into drug testing, um, there were five states that had legalization of medical marijuana, or sorry, uh, recreational marijuana on the ballot this election season. Um, two passed, uh, we're gonna talk about Maryland and Missouri. And then there were two other states that uh, did not pass. So North Dakota, South Dakota, which it, this is, um, they had, they thought passed that uh, a voter initiative and then it was overturned last year. So um, kind of, I think we all assumed that it would pass, but didn't. So, um, and then Arkansas was the third state uh, that did not pass their uh, voter or referendum. Um, so Mar uh, Maryland, uh, they have now legalized recreational marijuana. It was the ballot initiative I mentioned. Um, and, um, the likely we'll see um, a framework there coming out of that ballot, ballot initiative um, related to retail sales. Um, the, gen the General Assembly is likely to take that up and um, come up with uh, legislation or regulation, I should say, 
uh, not only love this legislation, but nothing about employer protections um, in the ballot initiative. So um, I think that's likely to be taken up by that legislation in the General Assembly. Um, it also, so passing of this voter, voter initiative in Maryland triggered a complementary bill that allows individuals with convictions for marijuana possession to petition, to petition for expungement. So again, you're seeing, we're seeing this trend where um, drug testing, um, marijuana legalization is being tied to um, uh, clean slate initiatives. Um, and then that bill says that by July of 24, the Department of Public Safety uh, must expunge all cases in which possession is the only charge. Um, but anyway, under the initiative, possession of an ounce and a half or less um, becomes a civil offense um, in January and then becomes legal um, in July of 2023. Um, so you can purchase and possess up to an ounce and a half for adults that are 21 years of age and older, and adults can also grow up to two plants for personal use. So I think we'll see more um, on Maryland. Hopefully, we'll see a little more guidance for employers, especially um, in Maryland, but so far, not much. Missouri, that was the second state I mentioned that had passed a ballot initiative. Um, and Besides legalizing recreational use, um, it also um, allows for individuals to petition for release from prison, expunge certain arrest and conviction records for nonviolent marijuana offenses. Um, it legalizes marijuana for adults 21 years of age and older. Um, it creates a lottery system to provide for licenses to sell marijuana. Um, and imposes a tax on the sales, um, identifies the beneficiaries of that tax. Um, they do maintain a fine for smoking marijuana in public, so um, legalize recreationally, but still um, don't smoke in public. Uh, and then it did also allow for municipalities to bar recreational marijuana. Uh, if they elect to do so, they have to do, do that through a public vote. Um, so. This one, uh, Missouri did include some provi uh, employer provisions. Um, employers still can prohibit use or possession in the workplace, um, can prohibit and take adverse action for working under the influence um, in the workplace, um, or will, you know, doing the job and um, individuals are still prohibited from operating a motor vehicle or other um, motorized uh, vehicles under the influence. So. Um, it also um, had some medical marijuana provisions. So um, employers in the state of Missouri or um, um, employing people in the state of Missouri are gonna wanna look at those medical marijuana provisions um, before, um, you know, when you're making decisions about your drug testing policy in Missouri, um, because they're even, they provide more protections for um, individuals that are using marijuana for um, for medical reasons. Um, so take a look at that in Missouri. Um, California. Um, so for those of you who have been following uh, marijuana legalization efforts, California was, uh, has, you know, they legalized um, medical marijuana all the way back in 1996. Um, and then uh, they passed a recreational marijuana um, law in 2016. So it's not new there, um, but what's happened uh, in California, they passed Bill 2188 um, and it creates some employee protections, so specifically protections for employees. Um, it makes it unlawful for employers to discriminate against employees and applicants simply because they've engaged in off-the-job marijuana use, um, unless the individual seeks or holds one of um, an exempted role. Um, the exemptions are uh, related to construction and building trades or where testing is required under other federal or state law. 
Uh, and then the law makes it unlawful for an employer to discriminate against employees and applicants on the basis of a drug test that measures only non-psychoactive cannabis metabolites. Um, without going into too much detail, um, that covers generally the testing that employers are doing um, for drug testing um, in the employment context. So uh, employers are going to have to be um, thinking about how they want to manage this in California. Um, you know, it's employers can still have um, drug-free workplaces, but they may need to be thinking about relying on um, more on their policies, more on um, reasonable suspicion, um, documenting um, symptoms of impairment, things like that. Um, California, of course, uh, takes it a step further. They actually created a protected class um, under their Fair Employment and Housing Act um, of um, marijuana users. So um, big news in, in California. The good news is you've got a little bit of time before it's effective. So we've got a whole extra year for California employers to figure out what they can and can't do if there are any tests that are going to um, meet the requirement um, that's been um, put into the, the specific language about what testing is allowed um, under that statute. So um, work there, I think, for California employers to, to be doing and thinking about, um, but we do have a little bit of more time than some of the other states are giving us. Um, DC, another case where um, they per, they um, passed an amendment in this case, right? So um, I think we talked about it last time, but uh, it did get it might have been right on the edge of of the last session. So it was signed by the mayor in July. It had to be reviewed or reviewed by the DC Council, um, and so that happened. It had a September 13 effective date. So does make it an unlawful discriminatory practice for an employer to refuse to hire, terminate, or take other adverse employment action based on the individual's use of cannabis or status um, as a medical cannabis program patient, or two, the, president, the presence of uh, cannabinoid metabolites in the individual's body fluids in a drug test, absent additional factors indicating impairment. So um, again, employers, um, you can take action, um, you can still have a drug-free workplace, um, but the days of sort of relying on just the drug test alone are um, certainly passed in um, DC. Um, you want to make sure that you can um, identify the spe specific and articulable symptoms um, that you, um, as the employer, observed about your employee while they were working or during their work hours. Um, that would have substantially decreased or lessened the employee's performance um, or which interfere with your obligation to provide a safe work environment. Um, so that's sort of the new um, standard in DC. Also amended the medical marijuana law um, and requires employers to treat qualifying patients' use of uh, medical cannabis for disability in the same manner that you would um, other prescribed controlled substances. So uh, again, just be careful in DC, um, especially um, be careful that you are, uh, that you have a process for positive uh, drug test results and identifying whether or not that individual um, is um, using it medicinally. Um, exceptions, of course, for safety sensitive positions or positions that require testing under other federal or state regulations, um, I shouldn't say. Um, state regulations, but other district um, or federal regulations. Uh, and then news, I think, to all of us, um, Minnesota snuck in, if I can characterize it that way, uh, legislation. It was um, part of their end of session omnibus bill, um, effective July 1st. Um, it's a little bit roundabout, but um, it modifies the Minnesota list of controlled substances to exclude industrial hemp products um, that contain no more than 0.3% of THC. So um, now Minnesota businesses are allowed to sell and individuals 21 and older are allowed to purchase 
edible or drinkable products containing no more than five milligrams of THC um, per serving or no more than 50 milligrams per package. So unfortunately, the law doesn't distinguish between the types of THC. So um, Delta-8 um, products that were previously restricted um, or previously unrestricted are now subject to that five milligram limit, um, perhaps an unintended consequence. Um, but products containing Delta-9 can also now be sold um, at those those percentages um, and in those quantities. So uh, Delta 9 THC is, um, you know, the 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 part um, of THC that that uh, makes people feel high. So um, it's a, I think probably not everyone quite understood uh, what they were passing in this bill, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Minnesota has a really strong uh, lawful consumable products law, so employers. Um, just need to be really aware um, that um, use of marijuana, of, the, of um, THC um, in these quantities is now allowed um, by the statute. Um, and so it potentially could be um, deemed as lawful uh, um, under the lawful consumable products law. Um, so Minnesota employers also should be thinking about um, how do they want to treat or, or what um, processes they want to have in place if they do have um, a positive drug test uh, for marijuana. Uh, in better news for employers, uh, Nevada Supreme Court affirmed uh, termination for off-duty recreational marijuana use. So this is the case that's been making its way through the courts for a while now, um, got all the way up to the Supreme Court. It's Caballo v. Um, MP Palace LLC. The, the facts of the case are interesting. Um, it was a post-accident test, um, and the uh, employee tested positive and was dismissed. Um, the, the case sort of rests on two arguments that the candidate made or the employee made. They, um, First of all, they asserted that the drug test result was due to his use of recreational marijuana at home, um, that he wasn't intoxicated or impaired while he was at work, um, and that he had complied with state law. Um, and then after termination, um, the, they brought this complaint against the employer for damages. Um, they said um, they, the, the, the two causes of actions that they brought were that his use was protected, um, off work use under the lawful consumable products um, statute in Nevada. Um, and then they also brought a, a tort common law discharge claim. Um, the Supreme Court, the Nevada Supreme Court rejected both. Um, so again, I think helpful for employers, they said, uh, and they pointed to um, the Colorado decision about um, lawful consumable products. Uh, and that in similar language there, they said, well, they, they did a deep, deep dive, looked at the language of the statute, noting that the meaning of the uh, prepositional phrase in this state is different from under state law. Um, and um, that the latter signals the legislature's intent to focus on state law. Um, and so they said, you know, marijuana is still, um, um, illegal under federal law, and based on the language of their statute, um, federal they they felt the legislature intended to um, also take into consideration the legal status of the drug under federal law. Um, so interesting, uh, similar to the Colorado case that we've talked about before. Um, they also rejected the claim related to tortious discharge. In violation of public policy, they said, you know, clearly the legislature had authorized employers to prohibit or restrict um, recreational marijuana use by employees, and the court to conclude otherwise would intrude on the prerogatives of the legislature. So, um, finally, a little clarity uh, in Nevada. Hopefully, that's um, helpful for Nevada employers just to make things clear about whether or not. Um, they can terminate or take an adverse action based on a positive drug test um, where the um, 
employees claiming that it was legal off-duty use. And then also news in New Jersey, we had some regulatory um, action there. Uh, if you'll remember, New Jersey passed <laughs> the Cannabis Regulatory Enforcement Assistance and Marketplace Modernization Act um, some time ago now, it's February of 2021, um, and it legalized the use of recreational marijuana for adults over the age of 21 um, and prohibited adverse employment action based solely on off-duty use. Um, but it did explicitly permit employers to enforce workplace policies that prohibit employees from being under the influence or impaired at work. And it created this role of a certified workplace impairment recognition expert and said um, that employers couldn't uh, take adverse action until unless the the um, the um, a certified wire um, employee observed um, impairment. Unfortunately, not unfortunately. At the same time, they ask the regulatory commission to create the certification program and that's that step has not happened so um, that requirement to to use that wire um, process is on hold until there is a program but this new guidance identifies some interim procedures to help employers detect or identify workplace use or impairment um, and um, Take a look at the guidance if you're a New Jersey employer, it's pretty specific. They did provide a form, um, which uh, uh, is great, um, but basically they said, hey employers, establish an evidence-based protocol, document it, any observ observations of behavior or physical signs of impairment, and then use a drug test to verify whether an individual's used an impairing substance in recent history, right? So. Um, they basically are still saying drug text by itself is not enough. They also have to document or do these evidence-based uh, protocols, document observed behavior. They um, guided employers to designate a staff member to assist in making determinations regarding suspected drug use and to use um, this form that was provided by the commission, a um, reasonable suspicion observation, observation report. Uh, they encouraged use of cognitive impairment tests, um, scientifically valid, objective, consistently repeatable, standardized, automated tests designed to measure an employee's impairment, um, or ocular scans. They didn't actually talk about whether such things exist or how employers would access them. Um, so good to get some guidance from the regulators in New Jersey, um, but um, Still some confusion, some unclearness, and then there's a question of when will that certification program actually get rolled out. So that's drug testing. Um, a fair amount of activity there. Um, most of that related to um, voter mandates or ballot initiatives, and then some regulatory activity and some some cases. Um, I think we'll see more um, action related to uh, legalization of marijuana here in the sessions, um, in the state sessions. So um, more on that probably next quarter, maybe the quarter after. So then moving on, um, a couple updates I mentioned on the I-9 form, just a reminder, we talked about this last time, but if you accepted expired list B documents um, during COVID, uh, which was allowed, employers um, employees were allowed to present expired list B identity documents between May 1st, 2020 and April 30th, 2022 um, during COVID. Um, the deadline to get that updated list B identity document was July 31st, 2022. So if, if you did accept those and you haven't gone back uh, and gotten updated documents, uh, let's do it, let's do it now, don't wait. Um, and um, that, um, yes, if you have questions about identity documents or 
um, there's there's a lot of great guidance um, about you know what to do if um, you know the expired document they presented um, during COVID when you ask them to provide an updated one, are you allowed to, to take some other um, list B document? Um, and the answer is yes, it just still has to be a list B document or, or a list A document, but, um, and it has to be unexpired. Um, maybe more exciting uh, for employers who have been following this, um, Another temporary policy under um, during COVID uh, has been that the DHS um, announced or the DHS allowed for remote virtual verification of I-9 form documentation um, while the workforce um, or the new hired employee was working remotely due to COVID. Um, and we did um, get an extension on that. Um, uh, in October, there was another nine month extension um, on that policy allowing a virtual remote verification of I-9 documents. Um, perhaps even more exciting, um, in August, the DHS published a rule um, on remote I-9 form inspection flexibility um, to allow that to continue um, post uh, pandemic. So um, it appears um, that they're gonna be open to that. It was just a rule um, proposal. So um, that does take those generally at the federal level to take months and months to work their way through the rulemaking process. Um, so more to come on that, but um, it's exciting that there was an extension um, and then even more exciting that they're considering um, allowing remote um, virtual I-9 form inspection um, flexibility to continue and to continue even potentially not just um, based on um, a, a COVID reason um, that someone's working remotely or that the workforce is working remotely. So um, we'll, we'll keep watching that one. Moving then um, out of uh, I-9 updates and into privacy, we have been watching the federal legislation, uh, the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. Um, it was making some good headway. We talked about it back in July. Um, it looked like there was um, maybe some potential for that to get some traction. Um, and then, um, Recently, fairly recently, um, uh, Speaker Pelosi had issued a statement that she wouldn't hold a vote on the ADPPA in its current form. And uh, mostly she just said, um, you know, she is from, she's coming from California and she said, you know, the ADPPA doesn't have as many um, protections as what California consumers um, already have and it includes preemption language. And so she wasn't willing to bring that uh, to the floor for a vote. So um, I don't expect that given um, recent outcomes of the election, I don't, I don't expect that uh, it will make it to the floor for a vote. So um, we'll keep an eye on it, but I think that one's uh, not likely to happen. So um, what does that mean then? Um, we are, you know, still have a patchwork of states that have passed privacy legislation. So we're gonna talk about California, um, Colorado, um, Connecticut, Utah, and Virginia are the other four. Um, Virginia's effective date's coming up here in January. If you haven't taken a look at that, uh, it's time to probably take a look. Colorado and Connecticut have July effective dates, Utah, December, um, of 2023. So a little more time there. And then just a reminder, um, California's Consumer Privacy Act, the CCPA, has exceptions for employees and business to business personal information. Um, those exceptions or exemptions expire January 1st, 2023. Um, there was some hope that the um, legislature would um, pass um, legislation to extend those exemptions and that has not happened. 
Um, so the deadline to get that um, extension has passed. And so I do expect that uh, those exemptions will go away um, and um, that uh, the C CPA will then um, extend to uh, employees and business to business transactions. So um, what does that mean? Um, be looking at uh, California CCPA to see how it affects you and your business and your employees in general. Um, California employees um, have the right to notice regarding the types of personal information their employers collect, sell, share, disclose, um, and the right to make a request that the employer disclose personal information it's collected about the employee. Um, they have a right to correct or, or they will have a right to correct or rectify the personal information that their employer maintains. Um, the employee um, has a right to request that the employer delete personal information that the employer has collected about them. Um, that's not an absolute right. The employer um, may be able to deny that, um, but you should be looking at um, reasons, um, creating policy around under what circumstances you would deny that. Um, they also have, uh, employees will have the right to request that the employer provide them with or transmit to another entity a copy of their personal information um, and that um, the employer EHEB will have the right to request that their employer limit the use and disclosure of sensitive personal information to certain defined activities. Um, so spend some time on California uh, CCPA um, if you haven't already um, if you sort of put it out of your mind because you fell within an exception, um, you got a little bit of time um, to look at that again here uh, before um, the end of the year. Uh, related to privacy, uh, but a little bit tangential, um, we have been following in the industry, California um, has a had a court of appeals ruling last year under all of us or none of us versus Hamrick um, that caused California courts to begin to um, remove um, personally identifying information from publicly available court records, so court access terminals. Um, and it's resulted in significant delays for employers, um, for background screening companies, helping employers doing um, background screening. Um, we were um, happy to hear that the legislature in California signed a bill, uh, passed a bill, um, allowing access to date of birth, um, which would um, have uh, vastly improved time frames for getting uh, public record information confirmed uh, at California courts, and um, the governor uh, declined to sign it, and he did so on um, privacy grounds, I would say. So this quote at the bottom of the slide here uh, came from the governor. They said the bill may produce a more convenient process for companies conducting commercial background checks. It would allow any public member to access individual sensitive personal information online easily. For those reasons, I cannot sign the bill. Um, so um, individual privacy um, concerns here seemed for the governor of California to outweigh the employer's obligation to provide um, a safe work environment for its employees. So uh, interesting turn there. Um, we're you know, continuing to just work with court clerks um, to try to get uh, records and identifiers confirmed. Um, when they have them, we are um, seeing delays, uh, but it doesn't seem to be as bad um, as it was back in May when courts um, started to take this information offline. So. We'll keep keeping an eye on that one, um, but I don't foresee new legislation um, in this coming year. Um, or if you know, I, if it does happen, I don't see any. I, I, there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't get vetoed again. So, California, and then um, on the international front, uh, some of you will remember. Um, the EU, um, the US EU Privacy Shield um, program um, that was uh, overruled or, or deemed insufficient. Um, uh, 
couple of years ago, uh, we finally are seeing a new mechanism making its way through the process to allow for transfer of personal data between EU and the US. Um, so again, President Biden had signed an executive order here on October, in October, requiring the Attorney General um, to execute new Department of Justice regulations, reforming how US intelligence agencies collect and use personal data. That was really um, the main concern um, about the uh, privacy shield that it that um, EU subject data um, was not protected from US surveillance. Um, the new mechanism is called the EU Data Privacy Framework, um, and it's intended to replace the privacy shield. Um, it specifically the executive order calls for um, data protections, um, doing two things: one, imposing restrictions on access. Uh, by the U.S. government to data transferred from certain overseas jurisdictions, in, including um, European Union uh, and the U.K., and providing for improved legal redress for individual residents um, of those locations that claim that their privacy rights have been infringed. So great steps. Um, it was uh, great to see some activity there. Um, so now the next step will be um, this will all be submitted to the European Commission and they will make an adequacy decision. So um, don't know what the timing will be on that or um, there's, there's some concern that it's still not going to um, make it past um, that commission, um, but great to see some activity there. And then um, for our uh, employers who are FMCSA regulated, um, who have CDL drivers, uh, you may remember about just about three years ago, uh, there the FMCSA established a clearinghouse, which is basically just a database um, of um, records about commercial drivers um, and um, the driver, driver's violations of drug or alcohol regulations under any DOT um, mode. Um, so currently, like as of today, um, the requirements under DOT um, are that an employer of CDL drivers um, regulated under DOT are re must conduct both, conduct both an electronic query of the clearinghouse and also must manually make inquiries to pass employers um, of, of the candidate that's FMCSA regulated to meet that three-year time frame. Um, now that the clearinghouse is approaching, it's, um, that it's been around for three years and employers have been reporting um, uh, violations and accident history into the um, clearinghouse as of January 6, 2023, empl prospective employers um, will no longer need to conduct those pre-employment queries um, of individual employers and they can go just to the clearinghouse. Um, note, a big note, big caveat, if the prospective employee was employed by an employer regulated by one of the other DOT uh, modals, so uh, the FRA, the FTA, um, FAA, then um, the prospective employer still has to um, go directly to those past employers um, to make inquiries about drug and alcohol violations. Um, so uh, it relieves the FMCSA employer of this obligation to reach out to employers directly if the candidate or the applicant um, had only worked uh, at, at other FMCSA regulated employers. But if they're working outside of those regula regulated um, that FMC regulated employment, they still have to make those uh, individual inquiries. So um, good news actually for FMCSA employers. Um, I think that will be a relief, um, both from an obligation to uh, make those inquiries and then also from an obligation to respond to those inquiries. Um, both of those things, both of those um, were resource intensive processes. And then just a reminder, um, if you are, if you do have CDLs, 
um, that you're required to conduct an annual query with the clearinghouse, so at least once a year. Um, and if you are on an annual, um, or if um, it's a rolling annual, so um, make sure that you are uh, doing those within the 12 month basis. And that brings me to the end of my slides. Um, Jeff, did you have any any wrap up that you wanted to do? You know, it, I would invite Anyone, if you have any questions, having gone through the material, we still have a, a couple of minutes, so you can type those in, and we'd be happy to address those. If you happen to think them after the, the call, that's not a problem either. Just send us an email, or if you're an existing client, you can send the communication to your dedicated client care partner, and they'd be happy to follow up with you and get you the information you're, you're looking for. I, I don't see any questions, Heidi, so you must have covered everything in totality. Perfect. And I, I appreciate as always, the, the update, there's a lot of stuff going on across the board. I know our clients appreciate that. And to everyone else, in advance of next week's holiday, Thanksgiving, we are grateful for your business. Thank you for joining us today. And we wish you a wonderful rest of your Thursday. Take care, everybody. Thank you.